time when things were shifting more than right now. Now when I look at Jeanne van Heswick's work, one of the first things I think of uh, is something that she said when she was working on a project in Shanghai, and she said things are happening so fast. People feel that they are no longer part of the change happening all around them. And you know what she's talking about. I mean, it's happening here, it's happening everywhere. And to me, Jeanne van Heswick is a real hero. She looks at really difficult things, alienation, loneliness, the way big social systems function, and she tries to reinvent ways for people to change the places that they live in. And she starts in a really simple, really direct way. For example, she did Face Your World, which was a project in Ohio in which she and her collaborators made this software called Interactor for uh, children to design places and cities and public spaces. And this was very clever because children uh, are really good designers. They figure out uh, the essentials really very fast. They look, you know, you can look at the pictures that they draw of like houses. There's a roof, windows, a door, and then there's a giant steering wheel sized doorknob. Uh, because they know that the most important thing about a house is how do you get into the house and how do you, more importantly, get out of the house. Anyway, when I look at that world which is constantly evolving and never quite built, the one that Jonathan Heswick is working on with many people, uh, I realized that this world made of people's imaginations is the world that I really want to live in. Now I want to take a second and mention a book um, here, and it's one of my favorite books, it's called How to Be Idle by Tom Hodgkinson. And it's a book about work and what it means and why we do it. And, and if you live in New York City, you know, when people meet you, you after your name, the next important thing is like, what do you do? What is your work? And so it's kind of a good thing to know what you're doing this for. Now, there's one chapter in How to Be Idle where he quotes a British newspaper headline that says, Britain loses 200 million man hours this year to illness. And he says, wait a second, since when did you owe Britain your man hours? And now they're coming up short and it's kind of your fault because you're sick and you missed work. And he says, who are you working for? And it's a great question. I, I, I think that artists really need to ask. And I have a friend who said, you know, I just realized that I'm not part of the art world. I'm part of the art market. So I think reinventing systems is a really important way, not only of looking at art, but of making art. Anyway, I hope you head over later today to the St. Mark's Bookshop to buy this book, How to Be Idle, Tom Hodgkinson. Um, now, another thing I want to say about Jeanne van Heswick's work is that I really like the way she's not afraid about whether it's art or whether it's not. She's just not worried about that. And also things often jump categories. Like for example, recently the composer John Adams was talking about the John Cage piece 433. And this is the one where the person sits at the piano and does not play for four minutes and 33 seconds. And Adams said that that wasn't a piece of music that he would just sit down and listen to. Ah, 433. And he said in that sense, it wasn't a good piece of music, but it was very good philosophy. So I think it's important to remember that it can be great without knowing exactly which category it's in. Nobody knows what art is, really, absolutely nobody. Now, a few years ago, I spent some time at, uh, as the first artist in residence at NASA. Now, NASA is basically doing gigantic mega art projects, like building a stairway to space in the middle of the Pacific out of nanotubes you know, electronics that grow like biology, it's making intricate robots and many other art projects. Now I met a lot of scientists there and I have to say that I learned that artists and scientists have a lot more in common than I thought. Uh, because they don't know what they're looking for either. And they do this in very similar ways to artists. They get a sort of a loose plan and then they make something, they look at it and they go, what is this? And then they have a very similar project problem to artists and that is, how do you know when you're finished? Uh, and of course, in order to know when you're finished, you have to actually know what you're making. So anyway, the most theoretical people at NASA were the nanotechnologists. And one of the things that they kept citing was Einstein, because they said Einstein rejected some of his most famous theorems. Why? Because he said they weren't beautiful. 
So what did he actually mean by this? I mean, what was he really looking for? And what are you really looking for? Now I should say that while I was the first artist in residence at NASA, I was also the last. And there was a big budget meeting in Congress and, and one of the senators was going through the budget and, oh, let's see, 30 million for spy satellites and, and you know, 20 million for um, defense shields and drones and so on. Oh, oh, oh $20,000 for artist in residency. Blew the whistle that that is an outrage. What a misuse of federal funds and it was canceled. Now, since then I've tried to resurrect this, not for myself, but for somebody else to do because I think it's really important for, uh, to be an artist in residence at NASA. I think there's, it's important to have an artist in residence in Congress, important to have an artist in residence in the White House, in the Supreme Court. We have the Department of War, Defense, we have the Department of Education, uh, we have the Department of Health, why not the Department of Art? This is up to you. I'd like to congratulate Jonathan Hesvik on her award and wish you a really great afternoon at the summit. Thank you very much. Whoa, that was a bit of